Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to One Day in Leeds. My name, is Char my name is Charlotte, and I'm an undergraduate studying in the Faculty of Performance, Visual Arts and Communications. And today I'd like to tell you about the... Have you seen this? It's all the same, isn't it? Trust, yeah. foundations, friends of the university, all giving money. And don't get me started on the alumni. Yeah. Have you seen the amount of money that's been put into this university over the years? Mind the generosity of foundations, companies and individuals, including the university's alumni, is well known. And their generosity over the years is central to many of the enriching student opportunities that the university... An enriching student opportunity. Really. Look, what have the alumni ever done for us? <laughs> the new Laid Law Library. Oh yeah, yeah, that's true, the game's that, yeah. Scholarships for students who wouldn't be able to attend the university without them. And undergraduate leadership and research scholarships allowing students to attend our university, develop their skills and contribute to their knowledge. Enterprise scholarships. Oh yeah. Enabling students to pursue their entrepreneurial passions and ideas. Yeah, my friend's got one of them at developing their new catering business. Do you mean gamekeeper? Yeah, do you know them? Yeah, I tried it once. Really delicious. The kitchen looks really great. Alright, I'll grant you that. The new library and the undergraduate scholarships are two things, Nick. The ZIF building? Oh, yes, obviously the ZIF building. The ZIF building goes without saying. But apart from the new library, the undergraduate scholarships, <laughs> the ZIF building. Sports scholarships for some of the people who represented Great Britain in London 2012. And we'll do again in Rio 2016. Bursaries for students doing fieldwork in Tanzania and other places. Into university centres for children aged 7 and above. Inspiring them to do the best they can at school and beyond. Yes, all right, fair enough. A super resolution microscope, helping scientists develop treatments for conditions such as heart disease and dementia. Which helped the university win a £1.4 million grant from the Medical Research Council to develop a second type of super resolution microscope and further strengthen its work in this area. Arts PhD, a PhD looking at cardiovascular and diabetes. Two PhDs and one clinical research fellow to investigate new treatments for kidney cancer and the use of viruses to fight off against tumours. The Cheney Fellowship, allowing exceptional individuals to attend our university, share their research with students and staff and contribute to our research. And an enterprise incubation centre. A reach for excellent outreach programme. Musculoskeletal research. Literary archivist. Cultural fellow. All right! <laughs> All right! What a part. From the new library, the undergraduate scholarship, to the ZIFT building, sports scholarships, bursaries, to field work, into university centres, super resolution microscopes, funded for PhDs, funded for research, the into university centres, the cultural fellows, the literary archivists, and the Muscular Scouts research. What have they done for us? <laughs> Stanley, in all the gallery. And the new Shedders gallery. Are you finished? And the new boat No house. one asked you. a bad morning, you know, I'm still, no, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> it's them, isn't it? I think I got off lightly there, <laughs> especially at this time of year. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Alan Langmans, I'm the Vice Chancellor of the University and uh, very pleased to be here, very pleased to see you all here this morning. Uh, not so long ago I spoke at a conference at the Rimsky-Korsakov Conservatoire in St. Petersburg and I was introduced, every conference piece speech uh, was introduced uh, by a piece of music. Uh, mine by an eight-year-old harp, harpist who got a standing ovation 
and I have some of the same kind of sense this morning. How, how do I follow that? Um, at least the harpist did not steal all my best lines, but um, <laughs> that is what's just happened to me. Um, whilst they're still here and uh, within earshot, I hope, uh, can we thank uh, the writer of that little piece, uh, Steve Ansell, and the cast, Charlotte Everest, uh, Liam Ashmore, and George Bissett. Can we say thank you? In 2010, the university uh, set out to raise uh, £60 million pounds as part of our Making a Difference uh, campaign. And two weeks ago, uh, we exceeded that target, just within uh, the five-year uh, timescale. And we did it uh, thanks to your generosity, uh, to your loyalty, and to the affection uh, that all of you have uh, for this great university. And as we've just been hearing, uh, it helped us create new facilities. Uh, it helped um, through schemes like uh, Reach for Excellence uh, and Into University uh, support the ambitions and the aspirations and the attainment of young people and students who otherwise couldn't have dreamed of coming to university. So we've supported, you have supported, 1,400 students from disadvantaged backgrounds, 150 undergraduate leadership scholars, 300 master scholars, and 38 postgraduate uh, research students. And the point about that is not just the numbers which you'll find in your brochure today. Uh, it's simply the fact that you have changed these young people's lives, uh, and indeed, uh, their life chances and that is hugely appreciated you've also as again you've just heard been boosting our research and the impact of that research in cancer and cardiovascular disease and diabetes uh, you've been helping us to develop practical things better uh, wound dressings incontinence products blood filters for safer uh, transfusions and you have helped uh, our staff and students uh, come to terms uh, with some big issues in research, the issues facing uh, Israel and the Middle East, business relations in China, uh, the challenge of carbon and renewable energy uh, in our cities. All of that has come from our Making a World of Difference uh, campaign. So these are remarkable contributions. Uh, you've provided um, vital scholarship funding. You've helped lever funding from elsewhere. You heard the example of the super resolution microscope just a few minutes uh, ago. Uh, Nigel Bertram, who is here, uh, funded a research fellow in sustainable agriculture uh, and a series of postgraduate uh, bursaries. Um, and the little group of people involved in that work have already raised an additional £600,000 in research grants. But perhaps most of all, the effect of this campaign has to be to reconnect us with our alumni. We are now in active contact uh, with 235,000 alumni around the world in 190 countries. That's not a, an idle uh, boast. Uh, we have their email addresses. We know where you all live. <laughs> and, uh, and indeed, and I haven't asked about the postage costs, we recently sent out 235,000 copies of our alumni uh, magazine, which people tell me and insist they would not read online. Um, but these people, our people, have become ambassadors for uh, this university. All of you and that wider network uh, have been generous, also generous with your time in giving advice to students, uh, enabling students to have internships in your businesses and organisations, work placements, uh, supporting and helping in a very practical way our teaching in the university, uh, sitting on our industrial advisory boards and giving employment uh, advice uh, to our students. 
So you and many, many others around the world have been opening up your personal and your professional networks uh, to our students, and that is greatly appreciated. And all of this comes at a time of uh, renewal, of growth, uh, academic development and investment in the university. Uh, over the next few years, we're going to be spending £520 million on the campus, uh, not um, on the basis that all those chancellors inevitably become property developers, which I think is what some people imagine, and indeed is true of some of my colleagues. Um, but we're doing it uh, to support our students and to support our research. So we're building new facilities, uh, technology platforms in structural biology and robotics and data analytics, in material science uh, and in imaging, preclinical and clinical imaging. We're appointing 250 new postdoctoral fellows, the biggest ever single investment we've made in the academic staff of this university. Uh, 700 additional PhD studentships um, and attracting, and we're already doing so, attracting uh, more top talent, uh, senior professors to come to our university, often with members of their team. So these are not just plans, they are things that are happening now. Um, and that's shown in the uh, results. Um, we were third in the Russell Group in the recent national uh, student satisfaction survey, uh, second only to Oxford in satisfaction with teaching and that is a great tribute to all the staff of the university and particularly to the uh, leadership um, of Viv Jones whom you will meet uh, uh, this evening. Our library service had a 94% approval rating and our student union, one of the best in the country as you all know, had a 92% approval rating. In research, we are 10th in the UK for uh, research power, 9th for impact and stronger than any other university for impact north of uh, Oxford and Cambridge. But, you know, all of that sounds great, but I can assure you uh, we do not collectively have a uh, complacent bone in our body. We think there's still much more uh, to do. Uh, and of course, um, as you will be seeing and hearing today, uh, there are no limits on our ambition. So with all of this in mind, having reached this uh, landmark of 60 million, um, what did the campaign board decide to do yesterday? Well, they've decided to extend the campaign and we had a job trying to limit their uh, ambition uh, with a new target uh, of at least, underline the words, at least they said, um, uh, at least 100 million uh, by, uh, by 2020. But more important than that, they're encouraging us uh, to embed our work on alumni relations and development and philanthropy so that it just becomes part of the normal working and the normal psyche of the university. Something that comes naturally uh, to us and feels natural, particularly uh, to our students who already do a great deal. Four or five thousand of our students uh, volunteer in Leeds. Many charities in uh, this city uh, are clear that they could not cope uh, without the help and support of our students. And of course, in a different way, uh, they raise uh, through their uh, RAG uh, uh, efforts um, enormous uh, sums of money to support uh, local uh, charities. So as I draw to a close and we open up this uh, day and open up the university to you for, uh, for one day in Leeds, uh, I want to thank all of you for the remarkable uh, things that you have done. I want to thank the Making uh, the Difference campaign board uh, for driving us on. My dad used to drag me around the hills and the... Uh, northwest of Scotland and you know that dreadful moment as uh, uh, in my case a little boy where you get to the top of the hill and you find that uh, behind it there is another hill. Well we felt a little bit like that when we were talking to our campaign board uh, last night. They are driving us on but they are also uh, a great source of inspiration and good ideas and they take 
tremendous credit from all that's happened uh, in recent years. I want to thank the North American Foundation for the University of Leeds. Um, I, I was in New York meeting the North uh, American Foundation uh, just recently. We had a great uh, alumni event there and then one in Boston and another uh, in uh, Toronto. And I was able to claim, I think for the first time, uh, Michael Arthur will recognize this point, uh, that we, we now had uh, a Leeds alumnus in every state of North America, including North Dakota. <laughs> Um, the North American Foundation uh, today is represented by Peter, H uh, Peter Hill uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and, and, and others that uh, have come here and travelled far uh, to, to be uh, with us. Uh, Peter Cheney, uh, Richard Bartoli, they, 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 or Tolley, they, they are uh, regular uh, visit, visitors to, to this university. So they travel three or four thousand miles to be here to join us today but they do that on a regular basis it's hugely appreciated uh, and the work that Richard and Peter and many others uh, do uh, in North America is hugely appreciated I also want to say thank you because he's sitting over here uh, Michael Arthur who set this uh, snowball rolling down the hill and I hope you can see today Michael that it's going to get uh, bigger and bigger um, and a special thank you, I might not have opportunities to do this later today, uh, to what I think of as the home team. Now, I can't uh, mention all of the home team uh, by name, uh, but Michelle Calvert, uh, Jane Glennon, Friday accordingly, uh, Simon Jenkins who, who is here, and many more, the staff of the alumni and the development office have done a great job uh, to get us uh, to this uh, point. I also want to thank... Uh, the students of the university who challenge and inspire us every day. We have a sprinkling of these students around wearing their fetching but very cold uh, red uh, t-shirt. Um, uh, and I, I welcome them on behalf of 32,000 uh, others. So we're here today to celebrate. Uh, there will be a public announcement about all of this in the new year, but you hear it first to preview some of our ambition and some of the great things that are happening in the university uh, and hopefully uh, to benefit uh, from your interest, from your feedback, uh, from your insight and, and, and your uh, advice. You all have on your desks, this is not terribly digital I'm afraid, but you all have on your desks uh, something that I'm told uh, I have to refer to as thought pads. So um, if you want to doodle on them or something else, please do. But um, if you have any thoughts or any ideas, um, please scribble them on your pad and stick them in one of these boxes that you will see uh, around uh, today. So this is a university that believes in the digital economy, but, uh, but the old habits of pen and ink still run deep. Enjoy one day uh, in Leeds. Please talk to the students around you because they have all benefited uh, from your interest, from your support and from your uh, generosity. Uh, have a great time and thank you again for coming and for all you do. It is genuinely appreciated. Thank you very much. Who in the audience today is a man who doesn't go to the doctors when he should? or who knows a man that doesn't go to the doctor's when he should. Okay, yeah, I'm one of the people here, yeah, and I'm that man as well, I don't go to the doctor's when I should. The psychological term for this is hegemonic masculinity. Or in other words, men don't show pain, talk about feelings, or their mental health. And this could be one of the reasons why men in the UK have a life expectancy nearly four years less than that of a woman. However, a low income man in the UK has a life expectancy seven years less than a high income man. The government has spent a huge amount of time and resources trying to narrow this health inequality, but policy, intervention, and even the new head of the NHS focuses on men's negative health behaviours and trying to tell men what's best for them, and this seems to have little effect. Now that should come as no surprise, as how many men do you know like being told what to do? <laughs> 
So how do we engage low-income men in behaviour change? Well, traditionally, low-income men are hard to recruit and are reticent to interviews. So, the creative methodology of photo elicitation was used. Or in other words, I gave low-income men a digital camera and asked them to photograph their lives from the point of view of health and well-being and then talked to me about it in a recorded interview. The research was participant-led and there was no definition given for health and well-being and the men were allowed to talk as much or as little as they wanted to about each photograph. Now this photograph was taken by one of my participants who I called Brian. And Brian used this photograph to represent the positive relationship he has with his girlfriend and how good it makes him feel. And this to a perfect stranger in a research interview. So far, I've interviewed 17 men. They've taken nearly 400 photographs between them and the average interview length is 72 minutes. Now this is from a group that the literature says doesn't like talking in interviews. The topics the men have talked about including feelings, friendships, families, mental health and personal limitations. The data generated can drive policy in the seminar to show low-income men the positive things other low-income men are doing and encourage them to live longer and healthier lives. Thank you. I would like you to look at this image and check if the car is parked properly. You got it. <laughs> the car is not in the right position. What I want to know is how is this similar to when a heap joint replacement is not placed in an optimal position. About 50% of heap joint replacements are implanted in what has been defined an incorrect position or outside of the safe zone area. If you have a condition like osteoarthritis and couldn't walk because to the shop because of pain, well, a hip joint replacement restores the function of walking and relief from pain. Great, job done. But 10% of patients require revision and that is another surgery around 10 years. That means if I have a hip joint replacement now, it is likely that I will require revision later on. So my position has been considered to be a contributing factor to failure. So my research question is, how does the surgical position affect the longevity of the implant? For this, I use a complex simulator that allows me to have different positions. It's like changing the malposition of the car. So, how far away from the line it is. The results so far showed that with a higher level of malposition it causes severe damage to the implant. You have to consider that we're no longer talking about a car. This is a patient. This is important. This could lead to dislocation. This could cause pain, failure. Obviously between the hip surgery, the patient's anatomy, and the activity, there's many factors you need to consider and bring into the test conditions. But current requirements for testing of heat joint replacements are carried out by placing the implant in an optimal position. It's like saying we park correctly all the time when we know it doesn't happen. If the current test methods that we're developing are adopted as an international standard for testing of hip joint replacement before it gets delivered to the patient, it we can help improve the design, make it more reliable and safe. The results will demonstrate to the clinicians how the level of malposition affects the damage caused to the implant even further. This to start making the guidelines for testing of any joint replacement, like the knee or the ankle, when you consider my position. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle, um, and I'm in the second year of my PhD, and I'm here today to tell you about the research I'm doing and what a difference a scholarship has made to me. 
I grew up in the outskirts of London, but I moved to Yorkshire to start my scientific career, where I studied molecular biology at the University of York. Um, I really love studying this subject, but most of all, I love doing the science myself and being involved in cutting-edge research. During my degree, I got to experience scientific research from both an industry point of view during a placement at GlaxoSmithKline, but also from an academic point of view when I spent my final year in a cancer research lab. Um, these experiences really inspired me and I knew that I wanted to do a PhD by the end of my uh, first degree. In particular, my experiences have shown me how molecular biology, studying the intricacies of cells, is so important to the advancement of medicine. So just an example, when I was at Glaxo, I'd be screening compounds against individual molecules, but this small step was actually helping to decide which ones would progress on to being drugs and help patients in the future. Um, so when I was looking for a PhD, Leeds really stood out as a place with an expertise in molecular medicine. The close links between clinicians and researchers are really important and scientists here can actually study molecular biology on real patient samples. Um, when I saw that, there were, that Leeds were advertising for PhDs in cancer immunology, I knew this was something I really wanted to do. And cancer immunology um, is a really exciting topic and is making headlines in the news currently. The head of our floor is Professor Alan Melcher, who is influential in the field and has led many clinical trials in Leeds. The interview was a challenge, but I actually enjoyed it at the same time, so I was really excited to get uh, an offer of a position. So my research is based on a type of new cancer therapy called oncolytic virotherapy. It's an exciting development which has the potential to help many patients, and this is because oncolytic viruses unusually prefer to infect cancer cells over healthy cells. Also, scientists are increasingly recognising that virus therapy is also able to arm the immune system to kill the tumour, and this is something we need to investigate further, and that's where I come in. Um, my research is focused on a particular type of immune cell called a natural killer cell, um, shown here. Um, and natural killer cells are particularly interesting because they circulate in the blood and they can identify dangerous cells such as cancer cells. They latch onto them and they can inject toxic chemicals in order to destroy the cancer cells. Unfortunately, tumours are clever in that they usually evade, um, evolve to evade the immune system and so natural killer cells are no longer effective. However, studies are showing that oncolytic virotherapy may be able to boost these natural killer cells into responding again. I'm investigating a specific oncolytic virus called Reovirus and this is particularly relevant because it's in multiple <coughs> clinical trials at the moment and so hopefully will be offered as a standard treatment in the future. And some of the people involved in these clinical trials actually work on my floor. So although I'm a lab scientist, I get to interact with the clinicians as well. Um, my first year has involved a lot of optimisation and preparation because the samples we use, such as patient samples, are incredibly precious, so it's vital to manage resources. Um, in my second and third year, I'll be carrying out lots of experiments and I hope to uncover um, currently unknown details about the virus and how we can better arm natural killer cells to kill tumours. Um, an example of what I'm doing at the moment is I'm looking at um, different immune treatments that actually may be used to enhance this effect as well. One day I hope my research will offer cancer patients a better alternative. I'm incredibly grateful for the gift of this scholarship and I would like to thank my donor for making everything I've been telling you about possible. I'm really proud when people ask me what I do and I can genuinely say that I'm helping to find a cure for cancer. And the scholarship benefits not only me but my lab and patients in the future hopefully. Um, I know um, personally how competitive it is to get a PhD um, today um, so I'm really happy that Leeds is providing these scholarships for people like me. Hi, I'm Janice. I'm also a PhD student, but I'm not really going to tell you too much about my PhD. What I want to share with you is my uh, journey from um, leaving school with only GCSEs um, right through to PhD. So I'm not a traditional student. I actually started um, foundation year at 28. Um, I'd left school, like I said, with a handful of GCSEs which actually didn't include all the important ones. Um, 
I did not have any A-levels um, and I definitely did not consider myself university material. I wanted to live independent of my parents at 16 so I got a job and did that and then I met a man and he's now my husband and I had two children and I worked in a bank for a while processing people's mortgages and you know life was fine, nothing wrong with it, not a lot right with it and I certainly wasn't challenged and then one day my daughter said something that made me really stop and think and she said um, it was in response to a question by her nursery teacher and she says what does mummy and daddy do and she said daddy goes to work and uh, he's an engineer quite interesting um, and mummy cleans the house now I didn't I mean I did clean the house but I mean I didn't <laughs> <laughs> only do that I was working as a, as a mortgage advisor as well but I didn't talk about it I didn't had no passion for it so I thought maybe I'd go into healthcare and maybe be a nurse so I started back at university at night school course run by the University of Leeds called Preparation for Higher Education. It's at foundation level, so year zero of a degree. And um, to get some experience, I changed my job to be an auxiliary nurse. And uh, while I was doing that, I passed over my modules and I really, really enjoyed learning. And while I was at, at the hospital, I kind of realised as much as I enjoyed the learning, didn't really enjoy the nursing side of it, but like finding out what was wrong and why patients' bodies reacted in the way they did in, in both in disease times and, uh, and in health as well. And so basically kind of how, how everything works, how it all goes together. So biochemistry. Um, I'd already by this t stage received five offers of uh, um, so placements at different universities but to do a nursing degree and I spoke to my tutor who was amazing and sort of said that's not what I want to do and she helped me move on to another foundation degree called in, uh, Foundation in Interdisciplinary Science and it was here at Leeds and Leeds was definitely my first choice. From that um, from that time I'd, I'd, I'd done quite well so I got the equivalent of um, three and a half A levels at grade A which meant then I could apply for a scholarship which I later found out is part of I've only just that so. so it's called the Footsteps Fund so that's kind of you guys so cheers that's brilliant <laughs> <laughs> and that helps me um, go on to do my undergraduate degree so I've got an undergraduate degree uh, in biochemistry which is medical biochemistry um, so I would never have gone on to discover how much I love science and that I'm actually quite good at it without that kind of push. So it didn't fully fund me but it was enough for me to go, do you know what, this is worth it, I can do that, that's going to pay for my childcare, I can continue studying. So I did that, I got a first class um, and during my, the summer of my first year I did a, a, a placement so where you get sort of to experience some real research. In a, uh, in, a, in a research lab here at Leeds and that was it for me. I knew I wanted to do my PhD. Um, so at, oh, during that time as well I, I got um, my name on a publication as well. So that's in the Journal of Molecular Biology. So that along with my first class degree meant I could kind of go for it and go for a PhD. So that's what I did um, and that's what I'm doing now. So I'm in the fourth year of my PhD but I'm doing it over five years so I, I sort of stretched it out a little bit so to kind of get the balance you know go raise two kids and all that like it um, but for a PhD for me has made me excited to come to work every day there's always a challenge there's always something that's gonna I'm gonna have to work out and, and actually use my brain and just oh, I just love it um, my daughter thinks I'm like superwoman so always a good thing um, <coughs> I was lucky enough to be funded by the BBSRC, which is the Biotechnology, Biotechnology and Bi uh, Biological Sciences um, Research Council. But there are so many great ideas and great students out there that don't get these opportunities, which is really why gifts from people like you are so amazing. So thank you. My name's Claire Honus and I'm proud to be the Dean of Postgraduate Research Studies at this university. 
I want to say a huge thank you to, to Mike, Oscar, Michelle and Janice for getting this session started. They have already illustrated far better than I ever could the amazing things that our postgraduates are achieving and the vast potential that they have to make a difference in the world thanks to you and to people like you. In fact, the Making a World of Difference campaign has already made a big difference to our PhD community, with 38 PhDs already being funded by the generous donations we've received. For example, we now have six PhD students in the Doctoral College for the Arts, which you'll be hearing about later this afternoon. Thanks to our Footsteps Fund donors, we have a PhD student researching the link between cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And other campaign gifts are funding PhDs that will make a difference in areas like stroke research, textiles, diesel emissions, water scarcity and arthritis research, to name just a few. And these postgraduate researchers are hugely important to the university. Our strategic plan has as one of its aims to increase the number of PhD students in the institution from around 2,200 today to 3,000 by 2020, a figure that will take us into the top 10 in the Russell Group. And this is not just because, as you've already seen, these are wonderful, bright, exciting people to be around, although they are that too, obviously. It's important to understand that the work done by our PhD students is not distinct from that done by academics across the institution. Rather, their research is making a fundamental contribution to our aim to be an outstanding research university in the top 10 in the UK for the quality and impact of our research. Postgraduate researchers are co-authors on some of our most significant publications. They're working with and sometimes co-funded by industry, charities and cultural organisations. They're helping us not only to deliver excellent research but to engage with real world issues and to provide real world solutions. In short, our PhD community is a huge asset to the university. But our ambition to grow that community is currently held back by a lack of funding for postgraduate research. The most recent national level information that we have, which dates from the 2012-13 academic year, tells us that only just over 16% of doctoral research nationally is funded by the research councils. Leeds, as you'd expect, as I hope you would expect, performs better than the national average, with a good record of success in getting Research Council funding for our PhDs. But even so, less than a quarter of our PhD students have got Research Council funding. And the amount of such funding available nationally is on a downward trajectory and likely to fall still further with an ever greater call on the university to match fund any government funding that it does receive. At the same time, the number of doctoral students nationally with no funding at all has risen to nearly 40%. And students in this position are of course very limited in the kinds of research which they can undertake. Anything lab-based, anything involving travel for instance, is pretty much out of bounds. We heard from Mike right at the beginning of this session about the really important work that he's doing around men's health, yet Mike's research is self-funded. And while it may be easier to find funding for research which has a clearly defined end goal, it's the curiosity-driven research, the research that takes you to unexpected places, that may in the end have the greatest impact. To give just one very striking example, it was a Leeds PhD student working on the development of a new contraceptive who accidentally discovered tamoxifen, a drug which has since massively improved the survival rates of women who've undergone breast cancer treatment. The university itself has invested heavily in its postgraduate community, spending over £10 million on its so-called anniversary scholarships which have brought 110 new PhDs a year into Leeds in 2014 and 2015, 
marking the 110th anniversary of the university. A further round of anniversary scholarships is currently being advertised for 2016, but we can only go so far. Philanthropic donations will help us to make our investment go further and will help us to, to recruit the young researchers of the calibre of those you've just heard speaking and those you'll meet later today, the research stars of the future. With your help, we can make a difference in the lives of talented young women and men so that they can help to make a difference in the world as they tackle the big questions from cancer research to climate change and from food security to clean energy. But when we think about supporting the promising young researchers of the future, we're not just thinking about PhD students. The campaign has also funded 300 master's scholarships, which in many cases have helped to prepare students to take on doctoral level research, whilst in others they've prepared them explicitly for the world of work. And our vision is that some level of experience in carrying out research should be an integral part of the lead student experience for every single student who comes through our doors. A Leeds degree does not just impart knowledge, in other words, but it trains and inspires students to be co-creators of knowledge right from the start of their time with us as undergraduates. In this way, we hope to identify and nurture talent early on, providing fertile ground in which our most promising undergraduate students can grow and flourish, and ultimately we hope mature into the kind of independent-minded, critical thinkers you've just heard from, doing research that in some cases at least will be genuinely world-changing. Thanks to the campaign, we now have 150 undergraduate research and leadership scholarships across the campus. These allow our brightest undergraduates to gain an early experience of research through summer placements which enable them to undertake a real research project and develop leadership and research skills that are vital to their studies and to their future. I'd like now to invite Peter Blackburn to talk about his experience of funding one of these undergraduate research and leadership scholarships, and we'll hear also from the, the person who's benefited from this. Peter. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my three years at Leeds in the early 60s was uh, extremely important to me. I've been very lucky in life, so when the appeal... Uh, started a few years ago I was keen to put something back and the area that really interested me were the research and leadership scholarships for two reasons really firstly um, and the university is very good at this they find very talented students um, and give them an opportunity to really broaden them and develop themselves and, and at the same time they're doing really meaningful uh, and valuable research the other week, uh, I went down to Jimmy's, sorry, St. James's Hospital to uh, see the project. I'm currently sponsoring Saman Mukhtar, and uh, Nick Orsi is her supervisor, to see the project um, that they're uh, doing. And um, I, I was so excited about it, I thought you might be interested to um, hear all about it. And uh, can I introduce Saman and Nick, please? Good morning ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Simon and I am a third year medical student and an Excel scholar. Excel is a scholarship that's aimed at medical students who show a keen interest in research leadership and innovative thinking. Um, the scheme is advertised to second year students and the scholarship runs to the um, length of their degree. So I applied last year and I was almost fully convinced that I wouldn't get it because it's the intense competition and um, I had to go up against students who had previous research experience and some of whom were also postgrads. Um, but I think what I lacked in experience I made up for in passion and enthusiasm and the willingness to learn. So I applied and I was lucky enough to be invited for interview. And the interview consisted of a presentation to a panel of very serious looking professors. And that was the most nerve-wracking thing I've done in my life. <laughs> this is not as scary, so that's good. <laughs> 
Um, but I finally heard back from them and they gave me the scholarship and I was just over the moon. So. Um, as part of the programme, I spent the summer working um, with Nick and his team at St James's and the project itself is looking at tumour markers that are expressed in women who have endometrial cancer, which is cancer of the womb. And what we were trying to do is find out the prognostic value of these factors. Um, so potentially this project has the implication to actually answer some of those prognostic, value, prognostic questions that women have, uh, which is obviously a really important question for any cancer patient, how long do they have left. And this project has the potential to answer that question. Um, before coming to medical school, I didn't fully realise or appreciate the importance of why clinicians should be involved in research. I kind of viewed them as two different entities. But my scholarship has not only made me realise how important it is for doctors to be involved in research, but it's given me the chance to get involved myself. So I consider myself really lucky to be part of that movement, which is getting doctors involved in research. Uh, more recently, I've also had a chance to go back into the lab and I'm working with a research technician. Um, I've managed to kind of look at a piece of placenta right from the point of collection to when it was brought into the lab and it was sectioned and stained um, to allow for easy identification. So I am involved in some of the new stuff that's happening as well. Um, and it's my work of being around technicians and researchers that's kind of inspired me to uh, pursue this further. So hopefully next year I'll be taking a year out from medicine and intercalating in a science degree. Uh, so that's something I really want to do and I think it's my scholarship that's really made me kind of go for that as well. Um, I've also been introduced to a wider network of Excel scholars, not only obviously working with researchers, but I've been introduced to students who've had this scholarship in the past. And for me, it's been really good speaking to them and learning about their experiences. Um, all of them have different research um, interests, so for me, I've kind of had the chance to learn from what they've been doing, and it's given me an idea of what I want to do in the future as well. Um, I'd just like to finish off by kind of telling you all about something that I learned from my donor, Peter Blackburn. So I met Peter first last month, and we spoke about his time at Leeds, and he told me about everything that he's achieved in his pers um, professional life since. And one thing that really stuck out to me was how he's managed to grasp every opportunity and really make the most of it offered to him. So I hope to take that along with me as well, and I think my scholarship has really given me the chance to do that and make the most of everything that's been offered to me. Uh, so thank you so much, Peter, for your generous donation, and thank you everyone else for listening as well. And I'll finish off. My name's Nick Horsey. I'm, a, I'm an academic pathologist. Um, and the thing that gets me out of bed in the morning is endometrial cancer. This is cancer of the womb. And it, for my soapbox moment, it, it is the commonest gynecological malignancy in, 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 in women. And it's massively understudied. So why am I mentioning this? Well, if we roll the clock back a few years, I was exactly in Salmon's position at the moment. I was an Excel scholar here at Leeds when I was training here in medicine. And at the end of my third year, I was awarded an alumni-funded um, LEAD award, uh, £4,000, and I sort of counted it two or three times to make sure it was all there, um, <laughs> and decided that I was going to spend the summer uh, using this money. And I went to Harvard Medical School, where I worked under a mathematician, very inspirational chap, Jeremy Gunnwaldner, and developed new models to try and understand how proteins interact um, in processes like endometrial cancer, like cell communication. At the end of my third year, I came back. I went back to Boston again in my fourth year. I went back in my fifth year. I went back in the first two years of my foundation training at Leeds. And I still go back every year now. Um, it's been immensely successful. It's the strongest collaboration I've had going, and it's been going for almost probably the best part of seven years now. Um, and that's all due to that particular £4,000. That £4,000 made more of an impact than any funding that I've had since. And it's led into development of new projects, projects into endometrial cancer, understanding how cancer develops. It's led into the development of new markers to understand how to best select embryos in assisted conception. It's developed into other projects that understand us or help us anyway as pathologists to better diagnose melanoma. So a huge amount of spread from those £4,000. But it's not just about me. And in fact, my job also as an academic clinician is to try and 
nurture the next generation. I'm not going to be here forever, and at some point, thankfully, some people will say, it's, it'll be time for me to bow out gracefully. And it is people like Simon who are the future of medicine, the future of clinical medicine, who will then pick up that baton for the relay race in research and who will be able to take it forward. Um, and it is through the sponsorship that you guys afford the university that we can create these opportunities to allow people to develop themselves to the maximum potential. It was great to have Peter in the lab the other day. Um, seeing you in white was uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, got coat very on. different. Yes, you've got your coat on. Um, but on a personal note, Simon got to meet Peter. I never got to meet my sponsor. Mine was from a generic alumni fund. And today is my first chance, actually, for a personal thank you. And I know some people in this room contributed to that £4,000 that took me to the US. So thank you very much. Well, I hope you found that interesting. Um, I mean, I think the whole thing is really fascinating. But one of the other things um, that really excited me, as somebody who was, was fortunate enough to spend a, a bit of time at one stage in my career at Harvard, was the links that Nick and is now forging between the two universities. And I think, in addition to those that were already there, but it, that of itself is exciting. I've sponsored uh, four students in recent years, and whilst most of the uh, programs are on the medical and science side, it is, it is very possible to have uh, an arts uh, leadership um, uh, scholarship uh, uh, and one of the students I sponsored, Lewis Haynes, uh, did, a pro did a project on Dante's uh, Florence and Verona, which has been a huge, which was terrific success and is now forms part of many tourist guides to those areas and actually won UNESCO support. So the arts is very much um, part of this as well. And later on this afternoon, uh, you'll meet and hear from Matthew Traherne, who was Lois's uh, professor and uh, uh, the person who looked after that, uh, with that uh, project, and he'll be talking about that area this afternoon. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. As you can see, a gift to support undergraduate research has an impact on the individual, on their research, but also it has potentially really long-lasting consequences that influence the whole way in which a student may come to think about her or his future. And, uh, and this, this makes these gifts at the undergraduate level really significant for everything we do at all levels of the university. Through your gifts, we are, we are developing a new generation of students ready to engage with research and to make the big discoveries of the future. And you have helped our students with their research in all kinds of ways. For example, summer bursaries have enabled students to participate in field research or to undertake clinical secondments which have not only enriched their research and their time in Leeds but have also had hugely practical, hugely important practical implications. The Making a World of Difference campaign sustainable agriculture bursaries for example are helping our students to find new ways to tackle the challenges around global food security you have made it possible for Christina Cleghorn, a PhD student in the Faculty of Medicine and Health, to travel to rural Tanzania to investigate people's dietary decisions and nutritional outcomes. Roshan Hannan, a PhD student in the Faculty of Environment, has been able to travel to Kenya to examine the extent to which farmer cooperatives contribute to rural poverty reduction. And Matthew Smiley, an MSc sustainability student, was given the possibility to travel to Burkina Faso to analyse rainwater harvesting techniques. Nigel Bertram and Hilary Spurrier, who are in the room today, have both contributed in this way and I think would like to say something about their support for these kinds of bursaries. Nigel, would you like to, to say something first? Uh, yes, five years ago now that I set up the uh, research fellowship into funded the research fellowship into um, uh, 
sustainable agriculture for, for both food security. And part of that funding provided sufficient funds for about nine or ten bursaries a year for postgrad students. Um, now, during five years of funding, uh, I regularly received reports about the uh, actual sustainable agriculture project. I have to say, 90% of which went straight over here. Um, but I've also received reports, a one pager, which are easier to read, reports from these. PhD students on their trips to rural Tanzania and places like that. And I've got to say what pleasure it gave me to read these. They all linked into the sustainable agriculture theme. Uh, but they it just gave me having visited East Africa on the holiday, I should add, that's a bit. Um, they all meant something. And the other thing that I reflected back on was had I uh, stayed here in 1971 when I left the degree in agriculture. Had I stayed on to become a PhD student, how much I would have appreciated having bursary funding like that to undertake such projects. Um, it makes me feel very happy that I funded that for these guys. Thank you, Nigel. Hillary, would you like to, to add something? I've only been sponsoring a bursary uh, in this area for about two years. Prior to that, I supported some undergraduate bursaries. And you might well ask, how does a history graduate end up supporting sustainable agriculture? Um, but my own career route took me at one stage to Sierra Leone to investigate development studies and to write materials for school six formers. And while there, I think it changed my, my outlook on life quite considerably because it made me aware of all the things that I take for granted in the affluent Western world and all the things that you can't take for granted in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so when the opportunity came up to sponsor bursaries for PhD or MSc students to do their fieldwork, I felt that this was really important because you can study a certain amount back in the West, but until you go to the place and you see things on the ground, you don't fully understand and you don't fully appreciate. And the benefit of first-hand research is absolutely enormous. It's been hugely rewarding to get reports back and to meet some of the students. I was talking with one of them yesterday who's just completing her PhD and has been researching um, the impact of agriculture in eastern Tanzania on um, the development of forests or on deforestation. And she's been producing models so that uh, she can advise the Tanzanian authorities on the level of architecture of agriculture which will have the least impact on deforestation. It's our future sustainable agriculture and how we look after and feed the world and to have just a tiny, tiny small part in helping students take that forward <coughs> is enormously rewarding. Thank you so much. In summary then, our researchers are doing great things at the PhD level and they're contributing in a really important way to the success of the university as a whole. We believe that we have in place a really good pipeline for the development of researchers, taking them from the undergraduate level and supporting them to develop in confidence, independence and subject specific expertise into the doctoral students and research leaders of the next generation. But in a context where funding for projects such as those you've heard about today is in ever shorter supply, we need your help to get this research off the ground. Supporting a student who might not otherwise be able to embark on a PhD at all can have an enormous impact on the student, on their future and on the research that they will do across a vast range of possible areas. And you really can help regardless of how much you're able to donate. So, a three-year PhD scholarship 
ranges from 60 to 130,000 pounds depending on the area of research. But the net cost of supporting a PhD scholarship can be as low as 11,000 pounds a year over three years depending on your rate of tax. A gift of 10 to 14,000 pounds will support an undergraduate research scholarship like the project you've heard Saman talking about. And this represents a net cost starting from £5,500 for a higher rate taxpayer. A bursary from as little as £1,000 could considerably enhance the research undertaken by one of our students by enabling them to travel to carry out fieldwork overseas. And let me reassure you that every penny that you donate in this way goes to support our students. None of it contributes to the university's costs or overheads. This is about the people who opened our session um, and it's about people like them and it's about what we can do as an institution to support them. If you'd like more information about this, please do look at your One Day in Leeds booklet or speak to your development manager contact in the alumni team and do please, as the Vice Chancellor has already mentioned, use the thought pads that we've given you to jot down any questions or ideas that you might have and leave them in one of the boxes here at the front of the room. Tell us what you think, keep talking to us and keep asking questions. Now, coffee is going to be available very shortly and I'd invite you to keep talking to me, to our students and to their supervisors, to the alumni team and to one another over coffee. But for now, there's time, if there are any, for some questions. We have yeah. In your opinion, which area of research offers best value for money? <laughs> I think that, um, I, d I don't think it's my job to tell people which areas of research they should fund. I think that to give money to support a PhD scholarship is a very personal thing to do. It's about the people, as I said. And I think, that, I think that your decision to support a PhD in a particular area should be made because that's an area that means something to you or that you perceive as being important. It's a bit in the same way that Hillary's just described. Her background in history doesn't seem obvious to have an obvious link with sustainable agriculture, but there's a personal link which brought out the importance of that particular area. And I would say that it's, there are so many different areas of research all of which are important in different ways. And um, it should, that, that the decision to fund an individual, because it is about an individual, as well as an area of research, should be a personal decision. And not, it can't be based, I think, on, um, on, on a kind of calculated decision, but really about what means something to you and what, what will give you pleasure in knowing that you have supported because we have, we have such a range of possibilities. This is a big and very broad university and so there are people working in all kinds of areas. I, I would want donors always to feel inspired by what they have given and I think that sort of came out in what Peter was saying about his, his support for undergraduate research and leadership scholarships and I think that that, that really has to be at the heart of, of what we do. Shall we, shall we cut to the coffee then? So there's coffee available outside. Please do keep talking. I'll be around if you want to ask me or any of the alumni and development team any questions. Uh, I'll be here, so, so please feel free to talk to me and talk to the students as well. Thank you. <laughs>